Okay, so it's looking like we're uh, we're at five o'clock uh, UK time. So uh, let's make a start. So welcome to everyone. Thanks for joining the um, PSM SIG uh, event. Um, we're we're very privileged to have with us uh, Ian Kamak from uh, Lancaster University, who is going to talk to us about um, systems thinking and teaching of systems thinking. Uh, so uh, Ian brings obviously a wealth of uh, uh, expertise um, with him from uh, sort of his uh, his time at Lancaster uh, and also that of uh, sort of his, his predecessors at Lancaster. Uh, so that's, that's probably enough intro, I think. So I'll hand over to uh, Ian. Thank you very, very much, uh, Martin. Um, and welcome, welcome to everyone. I'd just like to start off by, by thanking uh, Jim for encouraging me to, um, to do this presentation. And I think the, the actual preparation and hopefully the delivery of the, of the presentation has been a, a useful opportunity for me to uh, to look back and reflect on on my practice. So thanks very much, Jim. But also thanks to to Martin and Christina and Karen for, for organising the logistics of this. So so thanks very much. Um, please do shout if I go a bit quiet. Um, sometimes my microphone seems to fade in and out. Um, but I just want to start off by saying that you know my objective of what I'd like to do. Uh, today is to to share not only my experience but to share our experience of teaching systems within you know a, a university context or within a, a corporate context and um, to help us do that I've, I've set up a, a padlet which is like a an interactive whiteboard that we can all contribute to and we can all share some ideas as this presentation goes along, but also, you know, in the, the hours or days after this presentation. So I've placed the, the, the link for the Padlet up in the, the, the chat. Um, so please feel free to, to go in there, click on the link, see if that works. And, um, and as we're going through the presentation, if you're able to, you know, add a couple of thoughts or comments, into that so that the, the SIG as a whole has this as a, a resource that it can look back on and um, and hopefully use as a as a starting point to to closing that really important gap you know the gap between you know how do we actually teach systems thinking versus how do we actually go about practicing systems thinking within complex organizations now you know, what I'm trying to do today is to give a, you know, a very personal view about some of the, um, the challenges or some of the things that have made me think about how I do things, why I do things, how I could do things differently. Um, and it is, you know, very much a, a personal perspective. There's some other great literature out there about the, um, the, the world of, of systems thinking and, and how we actually go about um, enhancing that. So just putting me for Padlet link back in there. So hopefully Chris can see that. Okay, so so yes, so there's sort other of great literature out there, and I particularly you know recommend people like Holwell in 2000 for her critique on on how SSM is is taught and um, represented within the academic literature. So Is where my computer is trying to work for me. Okay. Go back. So this is what you should see when we get into the Padlet, and it's just in a structure that's going to follow the presentation, looking at, you know, getting a sense of what systems approaches are we teaching? What challenges do we have in terms of the, the methodology, the method, the application, the assessment, and then our ideas for moving forward. So, so that's what I'm hoping we can start capturing and then using as a resource within the SIG. So for myself, um, some personal backgrounds might make sense of, of where I come from to what I'm actually doing and why do I do it. I think I'm one of a, a select breed, perhaps unique, in that I started out my academic career in management science. I decided rather quickly that ancient history seemed far more appealing. So I went off to study ancient history only for 20 years to pass to find me back in the same room 
actually then teaching management science, um, which was a, a bit of a surprise when I, I, I woke up and realized that I, what I was doing and how I got there. But in essence, you know, my journey through that was stimulated largely by going back to Lancaster in 1991 when I did an MSc in information management. Um, so in that day and age, MSc information management was very dominated by soft systems methodology and, and using that to explore complex challenges within organizations through action learning projects. Having got my MSc, I then went out and was working as a, as a consultant within multinational organizations in the telecom sector within small medium enterprises and mainly within the construction sector and also I've been using SSM within third sector organizations to help uh, the senior management team so I've, I've got a sense of, of using SSM in the real world I've got a sense of the different challenges that organizations face and then in 1999 I went back into Lancaster to start teaching project management but also systems thinking ideas. And um, my teaching now is predominantly at postgraduate level. So I'm teaching systems thinking, problem structuring at a postgraduate level across three or four different courses, including uh, MBA and executive MBA level, but also I teach at undergraduate level. So I get a, a, a broad view of, of how the students are appreciating this. In terms of the numbers, it could be anything from 100 at an undergraduate course down to you know, 20 or so at executive MBA level. Now, in this last year, um, one of the things I've done for the first time is, is enter Lancaster within a, a global competition called Map the System, which is run out of Oxford University. That's a really interesting competition that's got a, a very broad aim of using systems thinking to address issues within society, um, but to, to share this across you know, 55 different universities and across different faculties and different groups of students. So there's real opportunities there for, for, for students to collaborate, to get to understand how, how, how their peers are using these ideas to address some really important challenges in the world. So, so in terms of you know, what do I do, you know, we mentioned I do it at an MBA level, or at undergraduate level, but what, what am I actually doing? Well, this is a, an example of a module that I'm teaching. It's a 15 credit uh, module within a, a UK university, postgraduate module. So it's lasting about, um, 14 weeks this module and what we're doing is we're going on a journey we're going through this journey of understanding problem framing then digging into a bit of detail in terms of be the problem situation using ideas such as concept mapping or ideas such as the business model canvas to start digging in a bit deeper and seeing how things are connected we're then drawing on which oh, pictures sorry okay so then we're drawing on rich pictures as a way of trying to represent and communicate the problem situation to, a, to an external audience and then at that stage we then start digging deeper into the situation so we're then using causal loop diagrams identifying the leverage points and having identified those leverage points then we bring in soft systems methodology. So we're using SSM there to actually explore the, 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 the challenges, the opportunities within these leverage points. Yeah, so it's a very much a, the causal loop is representing the as is situation. You know, what is the issue? What are the challenges that this, this organization, this society is facing? And then the soft systems is digging into some specific parts of the, the, the possible or the 2B situation. So it's quite a, 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 a different, different purpose we've got between those methods. Now within this, this framework, we're also getting the, the students to engage in research methods. 
So we're going out to uh, interview people, to do some questionnaires, to draw in the data, but allows them to create a, you know, a really deep, rich picture and a great causal loop diagram. But we're also getting them to manage this engagement in terms of a, a consultancy project. So I see this module as having you know, a lot of strength in terms of the system thinking approaches, but also it, it's it's giving me the students awareness of the, the ideas, the skills, the attitudes they need to deploy as a as a, a consultant working on a an open ended uh, problem situation. So that's that's the sort of breadth that I I, I cover in my modules. I even just creating this in in terms of the uh, the presentation today, I thought, yeah, that, that, that's that's quite a lot to, to cover and to cover well within a you know a 12, 14 week module, and for the student to be able to to to, to pick this up and to use these these skills is 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 credit to them that they can do this. Now. As I mentioned this year, I'm actually, um, I, mean, I think probably one of the other things just to mention when we're talking about this is, as you might have seen from this picture, the, um, the focus of my teaching is about you know, the application of systems thinking. You know, I don't particularly want my students to you know, go away from from, from the course, being able to speak about systems thinking, being able to articulate the history of systems thinking, but not being able to actually apply systems thinking. So it's very much on application. And it's also about learning, the, the personal learning from applying it. So it's an experiential module, looking at the application and then being, being assessed through the creation of, of these artifacts rather than assessed through an essay or examination with, with short, short questions, multiple choice questions or whatever it may be. Okay. Now, as mentioned, you know, this year is the first year that um, we've engaged in the math assistant competition. And, and that follows a similar pattern to, to the work I've just shown. Yeah, so it follows a similar pattern to, to this, but map the system finishes at the causal loop diagram. So it finishes at the, the representation of the, of the complexity of a problem situation. You know, there are a, an opportunity to present some ideas about what students might do or the solutions might be, but it doesn't seek to, um, to, to, to build into the, the structure, the, the, the soft systems as a way of, of modeling and structuring potential intervention. But having said that, you know, I, I do find that the, that the system is a, is a great way for the students to, 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 to see the variety of challenges that can be addressed using uh, systems thinking, problem structuring techniques, and um, and it's a, a a great a great work by the uh, Oxford University in doing this. So I've just popped up there, you know, two links. Um, the Twitter link is is really useful because it then actually takes you to the the winning presentations for this current year, which was uh, only a couple of weeks ago. The presentations were made, um, and then the you know, the map the system homepage there gives you some further information. But in essence, there's about 55 universities in the UK. We've got universities, obviously Oxford's part of it, um, Nottingham Trent's part of it, Lancaster's part of it, and, and there's uh, De Montford as part of it. So there's, there's a good couple of universities in the UK there, lots of universities in Canada. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really, really, interesting interesting adventure there so let's try to support that and that's one of the things that i might talk about a bit later okay so so yes yeah, so i was saying you know, what i'd like to to focus on here is 
some of the challenges. And when I say challenges, I don't say mean problems. Uh, what I mean by challenges is those things that are provoking my thoughts, those things that are making me think about, you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing it this way? How could I do it slightly different? And then broadly, you know, I'm thinking about challenges in terms of the methodology that I'm using, the methods that we're using, the application of these methods and methodologies to the real world, and then challenges in terms of the assessment. So in terms of a um, quick question about the use of a Padlet, what I was hoping to do in the Padlet is that as I'm going through talking about my uh, provocations or my challenges, then people can you know, populate it with some good ideas or challenges, provocations that they find in their practice. And then that the SIG has got this as a, as a resource for, for moving forward. Okay, so talking about the challenges in the methodologies. Yeah. So we're sort of starting off here, I'm, I'm being grounded within soft systems methodology. You know, so we, I'm seeing soft systems methodology as an action oriented process of inquiry into the problematic situations and that the users are learning the way through the situation, learning to take action to improve the situation. And that you know, SSM is this organized process in which the situation is explored using a set of models to gain purposeful action. But I think that you know, this, this way of, of using SSM you know, is, a, is a challenge to some of my students. You know, this idea that SSM is, is a conceptual way of looking at part of the real world and thinking about it with an explicit worldview. I think that's that notion of being partial and declaring the worldview is a challenge that we have to spend a lot of time unpicking, you know, so that what I'm asking the students to do is not to model the real world, but to model a way of thinking about the real world. I also find that students find the, the notion of the, of the worldview, the Weltanschauung, to, to be problematic, you know, to, to actually start digging into this and, and declaring, you know, what is your position that you're exploring this this situation from is, is, is a challenge. It's not something they, they are used to articulating. And I, I would say that I think that sometimes the literature doesn't really help, help us address this challenge because sometimes we see worldviews, sometimes we're seeing paradigms, sometimes we're seeing mental models, and sometimes these um, these depictions or these representations don't seem to be as grand as a worldview as when we read the core text by, by, by Checkland. And sometimes they, they seem, you know, perhaps quite, quite mundane. So, so I think that's a challenge in trying to get people to be explicit about a worldview and to understand, you know, what is the purpose, the benefit of being, being explicit about this. Now, one of the real problems I find is, um, is this idea about including power, including structure in this analysis. Uh, I remember many years ago, you know, reading the article by Ross Beth uh, Moss Cantor, where she's saying that, you know, power is America's last dirty word. You know, it's easier to talk about money, much easier to talk about sex than it is to talk about power. And I find that's still the case when we're, we're using um, soft systems methodology, when we're using systems thinking ideas in the classroom. You know, trying to, to, to bring in the notion of power, of who holds the power, what type of power are they using, how are they using this in the real world to, 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 to support or to hold back an intervention is, um, is, is something that, that I encourage and I nudge and I keep nudging, but I don't feel as if, as if 
that's fully taken on board by the students. I think that for um, some of my students, you know, that might be a step too far to explicitly consider power within problem situations. And the other problem that I think we find in the methodology, or I find in the methodology, is, is helping the students to get that precision of language. I think within SSM, you know, we have a number of terms that, that have a, an everyday usage to them. And unfortunately, in SSM problem structuring, that everyday usage, usage doesn't always align to, to the actual usage we want them to, to, to mean. So even the idea of, you know, what is a system? or what is a whole on or what say it is it, sometimes a, a, a bit challenging you know and i remember when i was first introduced to soft systems as say in you know 1991 i i being a diligent student i went out and purchased you know the checkland book the checkland and skulls book the wilson book and then after about six weeks i went and purchased a thesaurus because i realized my use of language wasn't sophisticated enough to actually gain traction within, within the world of SSM. And I feel at the moment, you know, that, that is a, a, a challenge or something I need to, to be constantly thinking about is how do I help the students to obtain that, that use of, of language, get that precision of language, and also to, to get that consistency of, of, a, uh, of their usage. So, having got those challenges to my methodologies, it'll be interesting to see what, what your challenges are, if you have any. Um, but then in terms of the challenges and methods, a um, couple, of, couple of challenges I find here. The notion of complexity. Um, now, I'm not sure if the real world is complex or if I'm just creating a complex world by by imagining it. Um, but when I look at the complexity, I find a, a number you know, of my students in a, a similar predicament. You know, they don't perceive the world to be complex. They perceive the world to be, to be relatively straightforward. Now, some of that appears to be um, perhaps a, a cultural um, worldview some of it seems to be a, a, a discipline worldview so you know if I'm teaching within a, a department of management science and 90 percent of the degree program is talking about the the value and the benefit of being able to quantify and analyze real world situations in a, a quantitative um, methodologies and suddenly I I walk in the room and start talking about complexity and the, the inability to, to, to use these, um, these, these hard scientific approaches. Then some of the students are looking at me thinking as if maybe they're, I'm in the wrong room or they're in the wrong room. So trying to help people to see that, you know, what the complexity is, is, uh, is a challenge that I'm facing in my teaching. As I mentioned, most of my teaching tries to, you know, be experiential, tries to give the students a, a way of, of learning about systems thinking through the application. And, you know, frequently I'm, I'm trying to do that through real world engagement. And so one of the challenges that I find there is the, the notion of scoping out the intervention. You know, the students are often going for a, a grand, a grand scheme or a grand plan to solve issue X, rather than you know getting a, a narrower focus and um, something that's got a um, you know a, a greater chance of getting back that depth of inquiry. Um, and I think that that's you know part of it. The challenge is having enough time and enough interactions with the students to allow them to. To, to, to get the scope of their inquiry um, set up nicely so that they can, they can succeed later on. Mentioned here again about these challenges of, of learning a new language 
you know, especially when we're using terms like systems, like bolons, human activity systems, in a way that, um, you know, they, they might not, never have accounted this language before, or they might have used this language in a, in a totally different manner. And so you know, we need to spend the time and energy helping people you know, get, get to grips with this language. So, you know, moving forward, I'm trying to think about how do I, um, oh, sorry, just a, a final thing on this is, you know, the challenge in methods is just this idea of trying to have a, a dynamic delivery method. And what I'm thinking about here is this idea that, you know, when we go into, oh, I think this, sorry, just apologies for a second. Yes, we, we did test this just before and, um, and it was working just before, but uh, it seems to be. Oh yeah, okay, here we go. So apologies for that. Another um, challenge I got is this idea of a challenge in methods, trying to bring systems thinking alive. And I found this quite, quite tough in the last year um, because so much of the teaching has been online this, this last year. There's been so little um, engagement at a at a you know face to face level, and certainly within Lancaster, the first term was largely taught um, asynchronously. So we were recording lectures in advance, and the students were watching the lectures in their own time. And I found this to to be a real challenge. Um, so one of the things I did try to overcome this challenge was start using. Um, animated whiteboards as a way of showing the, the modeling process and bringing that modeling process to life because as a as a learner myself if I look at the textbook if I look at the model in the textbook I'm not sure where it actually starts or where it finishes I'm not sure how would I go about creating something like that I just see something that looks very uh, very confusing, I guess, for want of a better word. And so using something like these um, animated whiteboards allows us to narrate the creation of the model and talk about you know, the challenges that the model's trying to solve and some of the, um, so, some of the, you know, some of the nuances that we've got within this model. So this is just a very short, extract from a, a series of videos that I created, each of which would be about 20 minutes long, just walking through, you know, some of the classic case studies in health systems, systems dynamics, etc. So the students can see, you know, how did this model actually come about? What, what was the starting point? How do these variables connect, etc. Um, so I found that to be relevant and I, I, I got, you know, quite a a lot of good feedback from the students about about you know just how how engaging those were. So some of the challenges I have in application. Okay, so what I am looking at here in terms of the application is this the idea of trying to get a, a dynamic problem situation that the students can engage with. You know, in a problem situation that is responsive to, to their investigation, that they've got stakeholders that they can talk to, that they can learn from, that they can adapt their, their modeling based upon that learning. And you know, obviously all of that is taking a, you know, a lot of time to, to create as opposed to you know, a static case study that it doesn't move, it doesn't respond to that. Now, sometimes you know, we try to, um, Get get a you know a halfway house by actually role playing some of the some of the key stakeholders within a static case study, and using that as a way of trying to you know stimulate or disrupt the um, the application of the techniques to encourage the students to to think about what they're doing, how they're doing it, why they're doing what they're doing. But it's again you know something that I think we we need to uh, think about in a certainly my ideal situation. The more I can go towards dynamic problem situations where the students actually have a, um, you know, a coaching relationship 
with a, with a supervisor rather than a, an assessment based relationship with their supervisor is, is really, really powerful. And then another just very, you know, <laughs> I suppose, you know, prosaic observation is that you know, there's a lot of, 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 um, of desire for the students to be working within, you know, teams that they know about, that they're familiar with. They could be classmates, they could be friends, et cetera, et cetera. Rather than, you know, pushing the, the students into much more diverse teams. And, you know, this idea of the diversity is going to be richer for them because we're going to bring multiple perspectives to the problem situations, going to have a, a hopefully a deeper level of, of conversation about it. So it's again, this, this, this idea of in the application zone, not going for what is convenient, but trying to push, trying to create the, um, the, the, the application scenario that is going to be really valuable and beneficial to the students in the long run. So here in the, um, looking at the assessment challenges, some of the things that I see there as being of interest to me is that, you know, when we're looking at the assessment, you know, what is it that we're supposed to be assessing? What is it that I'm asking the students to do? Am I actually assessing the students to be um, deploy the techniques in a, a thoughtful manner, you know, in accordance with the, the classic textbook? Am I actually asking the students to use these techniques to draw out insight? And insight for, for whom? Insight for the client, insight for the students? Or am I using or encouraging the students to use this as a as an experiment to understand you know what do they know what are they learning about systems thinking through this application and i think this this notion of, of where do we put the the focus in the assessment is is really important you know certainly you know looking at a, a number of articles you know we seem to still have a, a love of SSM mode one, where we got the seven steps of SSM. And, you know, people have speculated that perhaps we're still writing about that style of SSM because it's easier to see what we need to do at step one. And therefore, it's easier for us to assess what we need to do at step one. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, break out of that and, you know, go back to, you know, some of the uh, the, the original thought. So, you know, a rich picture isn't necessarily a cartoon. A rich picture is something that's giving us that depth and breadth of insight about the, the problem situation. So trying to do that. And then again, thinking about the assessment, you know, trying to move towards having integrative assessments. So, you know, when I spoke about the the module, the 15 credit postgraduate module, as being a, a series of techniques, but I'm not looking at the techniques in, in isolation. What I want them to do is, is to connect to each other so that they're telling this, this overall story. And you know, having that, that is a again a, a, a bit of a, a a bit of a challenge in my practice because you know frequently students are attempted to be more um, more tactical in their, their thinking and to divide up group assignments so you know person a does rich pictures person b will go off and do the causal loop diagrams and so you might get lots of interesting snippets but you know what i really want them to do is to to make a, a great connection between those snippets so that they can actually see the value of um, of this the, the, the way that the tools and, are aligning and, and building up this, this big picture. And then again, you know, this idea of the dynamic assessment practices. You know, so for myself, you know, we frequently get commented about, you know, the, the volume of feedback I give in terms of the um, formative assessment but for me the, the real value of this and the challenge I need to bring in is, is changing that into um, formative feedback 
making sure that you know a student is 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 seen as engaging with that feedback and is using that feedback as part of their, their learning journey so trying to to to, to move my practice that way as well and again you know this this last year i've been using um video um, feedback rather than textual feedback so i've been walking through in, in video format you know the, the artifacts for models that people are creating and, and talking about it rather than just just writing some summary ideas and thoughts and a mark okay so hopefully that gives a, a sense of some of my i say some of the things that are making me think and and trying to understand you know my practice at a, at a different level um where do i think i would like it to go in the future where do i think it might be helpful you know for um to this sig to, to to move practice and i think you know trying to 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 build i don't know what the correct word is so i'm using a hackathon but try to build a hackathon for systems thinking where you know students people who are developing the knowledge of the of the toolkit and the applications that they can work in collaboration with more experienced practitioners in a a real world situation and that they can learn through this this this, this collaboration so i i like what the, the map the system competition does um but i would like it even more if we could bring some practicing systems thinking thinkers into each of the teams that they can be then using that as a as a way of co-creating the knowledge so, so, so greater interaction between students of system thinking and practitioners of system thinking. I'd also like to see, you know, richer case studies of interventions within a, a business setting. You know, I, I often, you know, read articles and you know, certainly within, you know, the world of soft systems methodology, you know, I'd really like to see more articles that talk about the, the richness of the modeling that they've done and the diversity of insights that they've gained rather than, you know, some of the, the case studies I'm reading seem to be focusing just on, you know, a single model that they've been created that actually appeared beneficial in the case. So bringing in more complexity within the, um, within the literature, you know, perhaps talking more about, you know, interventions that didn't quite go the way we expected them to go and exploring why that happened rather than um, showcasing a, a success story. And with that in mind, you know, I've got this, this notion of, um, of a deep dive practitioner. You know, this idea that I want to really understand, you know, what is it that, that people like Martin and Martin's colleagues are doing when they're doing systems thinking and, 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 and how do I learn about what they're doing? So, so that's the, the, the deep dive practitioner that I'd really like to get to. And just to you know, sort of give an example of what I'm, I'm thinking about here is you know, we have you know, a general you know, model here that we can see a holistic relationship between the different elements and it all looks good and we can get a really useful understanding of a of an organization uh, or a problem situation using this template or something similar to it but what i'd really like to do is to move from this model from this framework to a deeper one and that framework would be looking at you know, ideas about, well, you know, how do I understand, you know, the culture? How do I go about playing the power game in this culture? How do I go about asking questions in this environment? How do I really identify the leverage points that are going to make the difference? And then having got that leverage point, identified those points, go about then building up that change coalition, the people who need to buy into this change, making sure that the leverage points actually 
aren't just going to address you know a non-systemic solution but actually build in that holistic picture that holistic solution and then you know looking at the the, the the personal practitioner how do you know systems thinkers working in this complex world how do they go about you know developing their resilience how do they go about you know being this champion for, for change in a really challenging environment. And that's the, that's the, the, the level of a, a systems thinking canvas that I would really like to be able to see, I'd really like to be able to access the people who can, you know, tell the students, my students, you know, these stories to really help their, their journey to becoming um, systems thinking. Okay, so that's my, my thoughts. Um, as I say, it's uh, it's been a, a bit of a soul-searching moment creating the, this presentation and you know sort of sharing some of those challenges and things that provoke my thinking over the, the you know the last twenty years or so. And you know they're, they're still there in my mind. The things that I I think I'm getting better at, um, but the things that I think that I would like to to push on further and develop that practice. So that, that are my thoughts. And um, I can see lots of people have been populating the Padlet. So, so that's great. So thank you very much for that. Um, Christine, can I hand back to you for a question and answer? Yeah, bit? thank you, Ian. That was really interesting. Um, yeah. I, uh, it was, it was something that occurred to me, but I've just gone back looking at questions and that's just thrown me out now. So I'll remember again in a minute. Um, <laughs> I think it was, oh no, what it was, was you were basically saying you really love to talk to practitioners who are dealing with these problems and come and address some of these things. I think that's a call to our SIG because I know there's quite a few people here today who are not necessarily teachers who are actually working in practice. So if you would like to help here and talk to his students or even just give him some evidence that he can use in his teaching, Please do get in touch and let him know. But also keep populating those Padlet, Padlet boards because we can use all of that, which is fantastic. And I've noticed there's some really keen discussion going down on there. So I'm going to look at the chat first and then I'm going to move over to the Padlet board. OK, Thank you. Um, there was one quite early on from Janos. Is problem framing described in terms of natural language? From Janos Korn. I think that's a bit of a it depends on. Hmm, how far you're taking the problem, I think. But yes, Janos, please. Yes, uh, that, that was uh, a, a question that, uh, that um, occurred to me, and I uh, come back to it in a minute. But uh, can can I uh, uh, say something else? Right, right. I take it that uh, you 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 agree. I would have liked to say you to <coughs> to to work at. Um, a, a, a simple example on the application of SSM because uh, I met it for the first time uh, in the 1980s when it was a great advance uh, representing a method of problem solving which nobody thought so thought about and I just wondered if there has been any kind of change since then because I worked at the Open University at that time, and we found it extremely difficult uh, to apply SSM. And um, I don't, I suspect there couldn't have been much change because you are still referring back to the uh, expressions that uh, Professor Jacqueline was using about the idea of hold on and uh, we are not thinking about the world, but doing something else, I don't remember. Yet. And uh, the application of the rich picture, which is essential. And um, so all, all this uh, leads me to think that uh, uh, the situation hasn't changed not much. <clears throat> and uh, to me, uh, the rich picture is an anachronism from the last century. And uh, it, it's a confused, series of thoughts that uh, doesn't hang together when you consider the catwalk and uh, the um, other diagrams. And uh, that's why I, I asked 
if your problem framing is described in natural language, because if it is, it's natural language which contains all the information <clears throat> you need for uh, formulation of problems. And this is what you have to exploit. This is where the, the advance is, in my opinion, to use natural language instead of going into these not quite useful, vague and uh, in, uh, imprecise modeling. Sorry, I'm things not sure that I are not really necessary. And I just wanted to show this book and I wanted to wonder if there has been any kind of change since then. That's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janos. Um, I'm going to throw that to uh, Ian. Perhaps Jim might like to come in on that. Do you want me to? Um, yeah, you go, Ian. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, so, thanks for the, the question, Janos. Yeah, I think when I'm using SSM within a, a, a consultancy context, you know, I am cautious about which parts of the SSM I am sharing with a client, you know, how I am um, sharing it and how I am engaging the, the community in. So you know, I, I am trying to avoid the, the technical language, but I am conscious in my mind of you know, what I'm trying to do and how I'm trying to do it. Um, so something such as rich pictures, in my um, experience, has always um, been well received by, by the community because it is a, a way for them to, to share their story. Um, so, you know, certainly I'll be using that, um, but I wouldn't be, um, be, be using, you know, some of the, the more, the more, yeah, I, I wouldn't be using some of the modeling language within that, that broader community, I would be doing that with a smaller team and then taking the outputs of that back into uh, the, the community. So I've got a hidden side and a, a bit that I'm showing, but I, I, I take your point, but you know, trying to engage with people in the language for their understanding makes sense. Um, but for me, the, um, the, the formal structure of what I'm trying to do in soft systems uh, gives me some some leverage and what I need to try to do is to um, package that in a way that the, 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 the stakeholders are going to be accepting of and get value from. Jim could you add to that for please? Oh, I mean I, I think I'll just pick up if, if I may at the point where you left off. I think the critical question is uh, primarily to do with, uh, shall, we, shall we call the group stakeholder understanding. Some respond well to and participate in building rich pictures. I mean, I think personally, uh, sometimes I use rich pictures in a reasonably rigorous way and sometimes I don't. But it, if I think about it, it is mostly driven by at least my perception of the context that I'm working in. And I think, as you would well know, uh, Janos, if you look at um, some of the uh, inspirations that Peter Checkland um, uh, drew from, uh, for example, Sir Geoffrey Vickers, uh, if you look at appreciative uh, systems, I mean, Sir Geoffrey Vickers did not draw diagrams, but he was very eloquent. <clears throat> now, some folks would probably find his eloquence fairly difficult to follow because he was very precise with his words, which I think is generally a good thing, but also his language would be uh, opaque to some and certainly perhaps challenging to people who are using English as at most uh, a second language. So I, I think the, the important point here and where there probably has been, I hope there's been some development um, although I don't think it's particularly well written up in an academic context, is in um, practice. The, and the question that Ian raised really around what have practitioners learned? 
there's absolutely zero incentive for most practitioners to uh, attempt to uh, write what would be published as an academic article. Um, you know, and there's nowhere to publish such articles actually. Um, so why why would they they bother? I think there's a lot more knowledge in the field than we're tapping into. So I think in terms of how Ian had set up this talk about systems teaching, and I think the inputs that he's invited through the Padlet in particular, you know, I hope that some of those uh, ideas would encourage uh, people who are uh, practicing uh, systems thinking and operational research to actually uh, collaborate and, and share those thoughts. So I wouldn't get hung up on um, uh, rich pictures. I know they're annoying to some, uh, and I, I think they're not annoying to uh, all, um, but don't don't get hung up on that. Um, I, I really think it's the wrong place to uh, focus attention. Can I just echo what you're saying there, Jim? Um, I've actually been talking to uh, Mike Yearworth, who's now editor of eJaws PSM Track, and um, he's been talking a lot to Richard Ormerod, who's um, very active in, in PSMs and, and has been for donkey years. And um, we're all kind of coming to this, converging to this point, and I've been discussing it with Martin a lot. We need more case studies. We really, really need them. We need them because we need to refer to them, to see what works, to see what doesn't work, to actually be able to study across the different case studies, because in many ways, I mean, as we know, soft systems are born out of action research. And with action research, you need a lot of cases to be able to look across cases. And we need to be able to learn from each other. So I think we are trying very hard to find places where we can have a repository of case studies. Um, I'm very happy to work with people if they want to write up case studies and they're having trouble with it. Although please, you know, I, I, my time's limited, but still I would really happily just help people get them out there um i know inside or is quite keen on stuff like that um i have been talking to mike about possibly something in ejaw that's actually the cases back or perhaps even a journal that's specifically for case studies which i think would be really helpful to all of us um across problem structuring soft or systems across the across the landscape talking of this ian mitchell's put a question up do you find the systems techniques come and go in use depending on the favour of potential clients. What about the one to you, Ian? Yeah, thank, thank you. <laughs> could I just, um, before I answer Ian's question or give my, my thoughts to Ian's question, could I just make an observation uh, about your, your, your comment about case studies? Um, as I understand it within the, uh, the new apprenticeship that we're having here in, in England, the systems thinking practitioner. There are a number of institutions that are, um, are, are packaging this with a with an MSc, um, and I, I might be um, out of date, but as I understand it, the apprenticeship assessment cannot uh, have been assessed previously by by a university, so it can't be. You know, the same as a, a university dissertation. So I think the universities have an opportunity to look at a different angle in terms of how do they assess their, their traditional dissertation, for example. Mm. And I think it would be wonderful if some of those universities went down the, the publication route. So they said, you know, what we want from you here is a a, a case study that is of publishable quality that can then add to the, 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 the general knowledge in this. And I think that would be great because they, these are going to be a, you know, cohorts of people who are using the, the systems thinking tools to address the complex problems that we're, we're facing in society. And they're going to be doing it with rigor. So, you know, encouraging them to, to, to start sharing those at a, 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 a some greater depth would, would be wonderful from my, my, my perspective at least. That's a marvellous idea. Maybe we should hold a workshop on writing up case studies at some point. <laughs> it might be good. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> We've only really volunteered you for that one. So yes. Yeah. So, so Ian's, Ian's question about, you know, yeah, so, so coming and going depending on the favour of potential clients. Absolutely. You know, in, in my, you know, my experience, yeah, you know, we're going to have people who are 
you know, eager to engage with, with the work that we're doing because it's soft systems and because of the legacy of, of that. But we're also, you know, there's going to be people who are, are turning away because, you know, they, they don't feel that that's the, um, the, the right approach. You know, they would prefer to use the systems dynamic or use soda as a way of exploring it. Um, but most of the work that I've done has been within you know, the field of SSM. Um, and I'm sure uh, you know, the, those clients have, have appreciated it. They've you know, asked me back to do more work, but there's probably been as many, if not more, who have not <laughs> taken it further because it's SSM. So I think it's, it's something about context and fit. Um, and if, if, you know, if, if a, a, a client doesn't see the problem as being a complex problem, then we're not going to choose something like SSM to solve it. Yeah, I think sometimes we just don't say what we're doing anyway, do we? You just do it, but <laughs> they don't necessarily know that it's SSM. So I've got a few questions that ask a similar sort of thing, which is how much is industry actually using these problem structuring methods and tools, these actual OR, soft OR tools? How much do you think industry is actually using it? I think to some extent, this actually speaks of getting these case studies together to show how much it is being used. Yeah. So, well, this, I suppose it's a slightly different answer, isn't it? But you know, the answer is, you know, there seems to be, you know, a huge appetite still for using SSM to to solve real world problems. Um, if we're looking at the, the the published journals in the field, so it's still you know a vibrant um, technique, and I think there's a an article published a couple of months ago from Manchester Met that was looking at the, the application of problem solving techniques and SSM seemed to be the, um, the, the main player in, in, in that limited field. But, you know, is that enough? It's probably certainly not. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And, you know, is that being driven by the by an academic agenda or by a practitioner agenda and again that might not be uh, driven by by the practitioners but yeah I, I i still see it as being relevant i still see great examples of of people using ssm right across the world and in different different domains and getting value out of it so so yeah it still seems to be relevant um in 2021. Yeah, I, I, I've seen a few um, questions in the chat that are of a similar sort of theme. How much is it actually being used? Is it hijacked by other people in the organization thinking that they can take up these methods easily? I think somebody put HR, we're actually seeing it as a challenge. <laughs> but um, as I see it, if they're taking it up and they're actually using it, then that's just great. What we need to do is just get out an awful lot of tools to make sure that they do it well. Mm -hmm. um, handbooks and things like that yeah um i think um graham presswick is here and he told me a few weeks ago in an interview that he felt um we needed he, he said there's no handbook on this stuff for facilitation for, for you know for designing groups of people for helping groups of people to come together for making sure that you're fair that you give everyone a voice you know it's difficult stuff and and thankfully he's come along to the meeting today because i said no you want soft or and problem structuring and systems thinking that's the stuff <laughs> so we obviously do need to get it out there more i think we need to, you know we need to do more writing and not just at the at the level of the, the the three and four star journals but actually trying to get it out into the public domain and out to people like graham yeah so i have we got any more what's about yeah. funding? Jim, funding jim had his hand up can oh, i just um, just sorry, over to jim for just a second please do. i just wanted to um i, I hope uh, build on uh, some of the comments that have already been made um and maybe suggest a slightly different uh, nuance. I think, understandably, most times, most practitioners want to talk about method or methodology um, because it's part of their, their toolkit. Uh, I've come to a view over, over time and applying a range of methods and methodologies in consulting situations that uh, one of the most important things we can look at is um, 
in a sense, the practitioner's own self-awareness. Because I think what Ian is getting at in some way is, what is it that practice can teach us about application of this particular approach or a, a set of methods or a set of methodologies? And I think quite often where practitioners run into difficulty with a particular method or methodology, if we're honest about it, they just chose the, the wrong tools from the toolbox. And I think, you know, the, I don't see, personally, I don't see any great conflict between hard and soft. I think it's a spectrum. There's a spectrum of systems, tools, of uh, OR models from hard to soft. And the practitioner will understand the limits of their own um, experience and hopefully co-opt others if they need to use different approaches. So not everything works. Um, it's useful to learn why it doesn't work, when it doesn't work. But a lot of the responsibility, I think, is with the individual. We can't blame it all on the method or the methodology. It's not always used well. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's the wrong tool. But I think we have to kind of face up to that. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think there's a lot of non-codified use of um, systems and systems thinking approaches and problem structuring type approaches. And they're often cherry picked for bits and bobs. Um, and you've got a lot of people using very similar approaches, but not really aware that that's what they're doing. And I think that's probably happening quite a lot. So we need a, a multi-pronged approach, approach to assessing how much it is actually in use. Um, you know, across what we call the real world. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's all the real world because PSMs, let's face it, PSM researchers are the ones who are out in practice more than anybody else, I think. Yeah, I, don't, I, th I think, you know, the point that Ian made about the apprenticeship uh, concept, I mean, I think that's, you know, one way of beginning to address this challenge of how do you build, um, how do you help practitioners gain more knowledge? How do you yeah. maximize the knowledge that the practitioners gain, even with relatively limited experience? So I, I think there are some great methods, there are some great uh, tools, there are some great methodologies, but how do we even know what's out there right now? Sharing, I think, is really important. Yeah, I totally agree. So I've had a few volunteers who are willing to help me with um, a workshop on, um, as you're talking about SSM coaches, maybe we are, maybe we are. I'm not sure. Certainly talking about a handbook. We're certainly talking about lots of case studies. The dog just decided to start whining at me. I'm not quite sure why, but he is right. It is now two minutes past six, and I'm very conscious that everybody's probably got uh, tea to cook and children to look after. Martin, I'm looking at you. <laughs> so I guess we should bring everything to a close. Thank you so much for Ian and coming to talk to us today. Um, I'm hoping that I can build some of this into my um, teaching practice. At the moment I do human-centered design but it would be really good to get them doing something that actually helps them to, to understand the system as opposed to just being told about it. Um, um, I would also like to say thank you to everybody for coming and a very special thank you to Jim for organizing this workshop um, and for persuading us we really should talk about systems as well as talking about PSMs. <laughs> so thank you to everybody and I hope to see you at the next event which is coming on the 29th of July with Robert Dyson and France, uh, Francis O'Brien and Vanessa Schramm coming to talk to us about problem structuring methods in the past and in the present, which should be very good fun. So okay. thanks again to everybody. Thank you. Thanks Ian. Thanks Christina. Thank thanks Jim. Take Thank care. Thank you Christina. Thank you very much. Thank you.